All right. Um, welcome, everyone, to our second keynote of ASB. I'm really excited to have uh, Dr. David Hu here virtually with us. Um, Dr. Hu is a professor in the School of Biology and Mechanical Engineering at Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, he earned his bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and his PhD in mathematics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. Uh, then he received a National Science Foundation postdoctoral fellowship to conduct research at New York University and worked afterward as an instructor of mathematics before joining the faculty at Georgia Tech. David's research has been recognized in the media nationally and internationally. It includes mentions from places like Discover Magazine, New York Times, Washington Post, USA Today, Scientific America, The Guardian, BBC, NPR, National Geographic, and many others. David's written a book titled How to Walk on Water and Climb Up Walls, Animal Movement and the Robotics of the Future. He's also earned an NSF Career Award and won two Ig Nobel Prizes in Physics. One is on the hydrodynamics of mammalian urination, and the second on how and why wombat poo typically has a cuboid shape. His research seems to stem from an innate and insatiable curiosity about why animals do what they do. Please join me in virtually welcoming David as our ASB keynote speaker. I'm so excited to listen and watch his presentation. As you have questions throughout the talk, please post those in chat and we'll get to those at the very end. So David, please, um, please start your talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Lena. It's great to be here. I'm glad uh, so many people decide to come to hear about elephants and wombat poop. So today, uh, the first half of the talk, I'll tell you about how elephants have different strategies to grab objects. Uh, we'll talk about how elephants can pick up tortilla chips without breaking them, how they even can grab piles of grains um, by squeezing the group particles together to generate jamming forces, how they can basically elongate their trunks almost 25% uh, so they can stretch to reach out objects. Um, but I'll show you those experiments also led us to questions about the skin and how the skin um, seems to reflect the limitations of the body. Uh, for example, the top of the trunk can stretch, uh, when the top of the trunk stretches 25% more than the bottom. And that's because of these large muscles on the bottom that are holding the entire trunk up. So we'll talk about how there's this interplay between skin and uh, trunk mechanics. The second half of the talk, I'll kind of do a um, uh, walk back in the past about my uh, foray with Senator Jeff Flake and uh, wasteful science. Uh, being called the most wasteful scientist in the United States is an honor I'm proud of. Um, and we'll end with a wombat poop. Uh, and if some of you stick around to the very end of the talk, you'll, you can see my camera. This is the wombat poop that's actually stuck uh, in my office, um, right next to where I eat lunch. That's fair to say. Oh, let's begin. So um, first, this is the work. The work I'm going to show you mostly this first half is done by Andrew Schultz. Um, he's a grad student who's going to be on the postdoc market this year. He followed John Ng Wu, who's a professor at uh, uh, Sun Yat-sen University. And we've got great collaborators, Joy Ruddenberg. That's her at the top next to a whale that she basically dissected. She dissects large mammals. And Claire Higgins, who we did the skin dissection work with. And if there are any undergrads in the audience, um, we have two summer positions every summer um, hosted by the Army Research Office called URAP. Now, elephant trunks might seem exotic, but um, you have something in your body that's quite similar, um, and that's your tongue. So elephant trunks are a family of uh, basically boneless organs um, called muscular hydrostats. They make up octopus arms, uh, starfish, limbs um, and caterpillars. Um, they're, they're muscular hydrostats when they're basically filled with muscle. They're just simply called hydrostats or hydroskeletons when they're filled with liquid. The benefit of having no bones is that you can have extreme flexibility. And that's of interest to the robotics community because people are interested in building devices that can you know, wrap around people's arms and interact with people without injuring them. One thing that the robotics <laughs> hasn't done is figure out a good way to coat these devices, um, how to make them durable. Uh, most of them these are made out of basically silicone, rubber, and things like that that are easily damaged. Um, elephant trunk is able to do that. It's able to be both flexible and strong. So it can pick up trees, but it can also pick up peanuts, 
um, and all does that with a, as we, as I'll show you, skeletal muscle that's about six times stiffer than human muscle, um, and having sort of a flexible but outer covering. Some of you are here in neuroscientists, and you might be wondering how the elephant does these tasks. And it's possible by having basically the largest uh, brain uh, of any animal. It's about three times bigger than the human brain. And most of it is actually a lot of the reason why it's so big. You can see the elephant brain is um, here, is this thing on the right, which is the cerebellum. It's Hypothesize this cerebellum is used to generate these complex tasks that you see that you'll see in the coming videos, um, orienting the trunk three dimensionally in space and dealing with something that basically has almost an infinite number of joints. So the elephant can be creative in the way it uses its trunk. Um, there are about fifty rutabaga cubes, um, and the elephants they eat about two hundred kilograms a day. So that boils down to two bananas every minute. So they have to be excellent housekeepers, making sure they don't uh, drop any remains, give everything up. This video is very characteristic. Um, you'll see that stain. Um, kind of. Let's play this video one more time. That stain of mucus it leaves. Um, people think it might be doing with, dealing with olfaction. That fire. Whenever it goes, it leaves this little. Now, the elephant also has some tricks, and this is something that Darwin observed um, many years ago, talking about um, more recently. Um, they've got a lung size that's about 40 times, long. Um, oh, sorry, 39 liters, and that's about 10 times a human lung. Um, and they can use that to generate air flows to help them grab objects. So here, it's getting a nice taste pile of leaves. It put all those leaves in a pile together just by blowing them. Here it's got a stick that's just out of reach. So it can actually blow against the wall, have the air blow off the wall, reflect on the stick, and use that new force to bring the stick closer to it, all while standing on three legs. Elephants have an intuitive feel for liquids and how those liquids have been used to move solids into their mouths. Now, Darwin knew that elephants could blow, but he didn't mention this. That's the sound if you ever go to a Chinese noodle restaurant here, people slipping up noodles. That's the elephant food. Generating that much force to pull these uh, particles in, um, it only does it when it needs to. For example, in this instance, four uh, chips realize it doesn't. There it goes, still leave that. So there's a regime in which elephants will use suction. Um, it uses it for objects that are many in number. So those are sort of nutrient rich that it's worthwhile for it to bring it up. Um, and objects that are sufficiently small that it's force that it generates can actually pull up the chip. Um, and we've shown that if the objects are too big, it won't even try. Um, but we did want to sort of test the limits of uh, how it's able to do this. So um, let me show you the absolute limitation in how much the elephants can pick up. Um, this is the most fragile object we could find. This is at our local farmer's market, a tortilla chip um, that breaks at just about a kilogram of force. So it's quite easy to break. So here's the elephant grabbing for it. Um, they're known to kind of be myopic. So it kind of misses the chip in the beginning, touches the force plate. This is Yonghe Chang's force plate. Um, digs around for it and touches it with the tips of its uh, two, what you call fingers at the tip of its trunk. There it applies a suction and is able to sort of pick it up just like it has, in, has some adhesives on the bottom of its trunk. So let's play this one more time. I'll show later that, so it's one of the big questions is how the elephant can sense through the thick skin on its trunk. It's many times thicker than the skin on the bottom of your foot. Um, it's thought it's, it's done so with uh, these many hairs that sort of act like a rabbit's whiskers. I'll show you the mapping we have of all of the hairs near the end. So there it is again. Um, and here it's got to pull up the suction because the tip is thin enough that it can't really reach around. Now that's what happens when we're allowed to have free reign. 
Um, but once we obscure its view and its orientation, relevance actually have the ability to come up with a break. Um, they just end up breaking these chips, uh, and they're not really happy about that. They like to eat these much. So we wrote a mathematical model for how far away they had to be from the chip um, in order to suck it and pick it up. But for that model, we have to basically yeah. quantify it with how much pressure they get. So the measure of pressure, we actually need water. Um, that's it, sucking up about three liters of water and one point five seconds. This is it in high speed video with some tasty chia seeds that lies. The center of the trunk is really pulling up. So it generates a speed of about um, uh, three liters per second, which I said is about 20 toilets flushing at the same time. It can fit six liters of water in the trunk. Um, uh, and it does so using a pressure that's around 10 kilopascals. The amazing thing about that is that that's the same pressure as the human lung. Um, so it uses the same lung pressure as us, but it's able to pick up objects that are far larger than you can pick up with your own nose. I mean, uh, for example, if I have uh, this, the largest thing you ever can grab at home is probably this piece of paper. Here, this is me. Um, that's about the largest you can get up. Uh, if you try a tortilla chip, you'll fail. Um, but elephants can do it with the same pressure as you have in your lungs. So, um, and that's about half as much as a vacuum cleaner. So I'll talk about um, uh, the reason for why that is in a second. Um, first, the reason why I can fix six liters in the trunk is because it's actually able to expand its nasal cavities. So this uh, cross section is actually a cross section of the trunk. Um, you can see a lot of the muscles are pointed radially outward. Um, and those purpose is to do two things. One, to expand the nostrils and um, also to contract, so to contract the trunk, which allows it to elongate. Um, and I'll just show you that'll be important in reaching faraway objects. So they can contract it about 10 to 15%, which can increase um, the volume, um, the square of those numbers. So if you can suck at 10, kilo, 10 um, kilopascals and you've got tr a trunk diameter um, of a couple centimeters, that results in an airspeed of around 160 miles per hour. So that's why you can hear these elephants sucking and it sounds like, literally sounds like a vacuum cleaner, 160 miles an hour. Um, there's about half as much as the high speed train and that's faster than the human sneeze. And the reason why it's so capable of picking up objects is that um, the elephants have two things. They've got one, this large lung capacity, about 10 times your lungs, um, and also a nostril diameter that's about three times. So um, you can basically imagine putting your toe, your big toe into your nostrils. That's how big their nostrils are. Um, and the combination of those two together allows you to have a really large flow rate and a large flow duration. They can have this a high flow speed for almost four seconds. Um, so that allows them to be around about uh, two centimeters above an object and still be able to grab it. If you look at the nostril sizes of all sorts of mammals, you'll find that um, humans would have to be within like less than a millimeter to any object, uh, to a tortilla chip if wanted to grab it. And the problem is there's all these air leakages that it's not really possible to generate speeds of that long duration and to be so close. So it's really only elephants that are, have the wide enough nostrils to be able to uh, pick things up. So tortilla chips, you saw how they get tortilla chips, but what about if they want to eat smaller fare? Um, in the wild, they might uh, encounter seed, um, small grains. Good girl, Kelly. I know, that's a new fun part. That's the head trap. Good girl. So it does it how you would think you would grab a pile of flour. You would sort of squeeze the bits together. So 
one thing when when uh, we're using Young He Chang's force platform, one of the things we discovered was that they apply larger forces uh, when they're picking up smaller things. Um, and the other thing we noticed is that they do those apply those forces by making kinks in their chomp. Um, when you're making basically making about a hun hundreds of trips a day to grab food, you want to save as much energy as possible. And um, the basic length of the trunk that after the kink, so this is the picking up a bran, uh, a pile of bran, it makes about 11 centimeter sort of length. Um, what we think is going on is using the weight of that segment of the trunk to act as dead weight to apply forces. Um, basically, if you want to pick up objects, you need to jam them together. And the smaller the objects are, the more chances you have of them falling apart and breaking. Um, yeah, I did have to. Uh, um, yeah, your your elephant, your uh, Yonghe Cheng, your um, force platform might have a little mucus on it. Um, um, you basically squeeze the particles together. So how can you understand that? Um, basically, imagine you've got just picking up three carrots. You can easily, um, for example, hold three tissue boxes in your hand by squeezing them from the side, which is what the elephants do. But imagine if you increase that number, um, each of them has a very small chance of falling out. Um, and the more and more particles you have, uh, those chances go up dramatically. So you've got to increase your force exponentially in order to really hold on uh, to more particles. Um, so for example, here, when I just double the number of particles, it's much easier uh, to, drop, to drop those items. So Elephant has figured that out, and that's how it solved the problem. I mentioned elephants are able to keep them down. So, why did look at the techniques that elephants use? This is not really testing elephants' strength. Our bell is only Look at what happens here. It's able to. This is actually 95 pounds. David? Yeah. Your, your audio is going out with the video. The video is over coming in. So can you say what you were going to say again? Oh, I'm Sorry. glad you mentioned that. Um, the, yeah, these videos are a little loud. Let me just lower, lower it again. Thanks. Um, um, so I'm going to show you a couple of sequences and things we learned from how elephants pick up uh, barbells of varying weight. Um, and one of the things we discovered was that elephants, um, they repeat the same techniques of human weightlifters in that um, they basically decrease their power as they approach their one uh, repetition maximum. So um, this, this is them, we, we haven't really taught them to pick up these barbells. This is just their own strength applying, but they basically have this basically lower power for the largest weights. Um, the other thing we can observe from these videos is you probably observed substantial trunk bending. Um, so the only, measurement of elephant trunk stiffness was um, done uh, by Wainwright uh, almost 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, for example, these are the maximum deflections of the trunk um, for picking up basically the, the, light, the lightest weights on the top, brought it all the way top to the heaviest weights. Um, you can see that the heaviest weights, it really deformed substantially. Um, based on this, the thickness of the trunk and the weights carried, you can extrapolate that the Young's modulus is about um, one megapascal. Um, and that's about, uh, that's almost 10 times stiffer than human, human skeletal muscle. Um, but it's on par with what you can get with hydrostatic uh, skeletons. So caterpillars, for example, have been known when they're tensing, they can actually get to six megapascals of stiffness. Um, that's possible because of the capabilities of fluid to really resist against the skin. How the elephants can generate so much, uh, such a high stiffness is still uh, not understood, but maybe we can talk about the Q&A. Another technique, as you noticed from the videos, is the elephants are capable of really keeping a grip despite going from you know, the 20 kilograms all the way to 70 kilograms, and not just using the very tips of their trunk, which is sort of the trunk fingers you saw picking up the tortilla chip, but using the entire appendage as kind of a wrap. Wrapping higher angles it uses this idea that the sailors invented called the capstan, where if you wrap around an object, you apply forces not just at the end of the rope, which is what you would do with a tensile, uh, basically just the tensile load, but also with the friction of the rope 
resisting sliding all along the capstan. Um, and elephants can wrap uh, almost uh, entire two loops around, more than 360 degrees. Um, if you use a friction coefficient of human skin on steel, and you've used a gravitational force equal to the sort of limp weight of the trunk that's sort of wrapped around, sort of as, as a hanging down, um, you get a curve that's a little bit too high. Um, what's a better approximation is if you have a friction coefficient that's around 1.5, which is that of comparable to sort of uh, snakes on trees. And it might, it might be that the basically the wrinkles on the trunk sort of act to amplify the friction. So you can get higher than you would expect for human, human skin. The next part of the talk, I'll tell you a little bit about um, elongation. Um, so a lot of times elephants just don't have enough reach. Um, they just can't get to an object. So here it's actually able to elongate um, its trunk. Um, here, I'll fast forward. 25% um, in a matter of a couple of seconds. This is a high speed video. Um, couple of seconds to get that extra amount of reach. It does so by squeezing. So um, Bill here discovered that all hydrostats uh, basically satisfy concentration of volume. So for example, your tongue, if you want to extend it, you've got to basically contract it from the sides in order to sort of squeeze it like a toothpaste tube to have it go forward. Um, when it does this extension, it does it in a telescoping manner. So um, this is the strain um, as a function of time along the length of the trunk. So the tip is basically extending first. Um, and that makes sense because that has the sort of least cross-sectional area. If you think of the work involved, that's the least amount. And then it does um, basically extends the middle of it a little bit more. And it's very strange, but the very middle of the trunk seems to lag, whereas the sort of base starts to catch up. Um, so it's still not known why they don't just extend telescopically in a more uniform manner, why they have to sort of have high extension sort of near the base and near the tip. It might have to do with sort of uh, balancing and um, preventing from you know, drooping in the middle. One of the things we notice is that the bigger you are, the less you can stretch. And that's consistent with a lot of track trends. Um, so basically, you measure the stretch percentage of chameleons and frogs and dogs and cows. The bigger you are, you stretch less. Uh, and it's still not understood why. If any of you have an answer, I'd be grateful because we're writing this paper up. Um, but uh, the male elephant stretches only 13%. The female elephant, uh, which is almost half its weight, stretches um, uh, 25%. And those are consistent with what you expect for animals, uh, allometric trends for animals all the way down to chameleons. The, so it's, uh, that gives you a prediction of 15% and 7%. So the other thing I mentioned is that, and this got us into understanding the properties of skin is the elephant trunk is really, as I'll show you some interesting videos of the top and bottom, they're really like two different appendages. The top of it um, is a lot more capable of stretching. Um, so the top of it uh, gets the stra strains of around 25% um, and the, the uh, 25, 35%, and the bottom uh, really um, uh, much less. And part of that is due to the these large oblique muscles. So. Necessarily, the elephant trunk has got to support its weight um, by having oblique muscles that are sort of contracting when it's extending. And that's something that octopuses don't have. have. If you're underwater, you're supported weight by the water around you. And we suspect um, octopuses, when they extend, they extend uniformly in all directions. But elephant has this problem. The bottom is really, really stiff. And that's one of the problems of being really large. Once you're really large, your trunk, you know, this trunk weighs 125 kilograms. It's got to have really strong muscles. Moreover, it's cantilevered, so it's got to have strong muscles to fight that. And the rest of the body has seemed to sort of go around with this fact that it's large and it has these extra uh, mus uh, unflexible muscles at the base. I mentioned the trunk is really almost two different trunks. So this is the a dissected elephant trunk, uh, one that died at the Smithsonian 20 years ago. Joy Reidenberg and us, we were lucky enough to be able to dissect it in the last year. Um, that's the, the dorsal part of the trunk, the part that interacts with the sun, uh, bumps against trees. It's got these things called folds. 
In the middle, you see a chunk that looks very, very different. Um, it's filled with what we call wrinkles. Um, basically, you can see the bottom, um, it's got less uh, capable strain. So it, it basically, um, it, it's in these wrinkles that have lots of different directionality. The trunk, the dorsal part is really meant um, to really curl only in one direction, sort of in this direction. The stress strain curve for these materials also replicate the fact that in the beginning of the stretch, we actually see dorsal and ventral um, going together. You see um, these two curves having the same strain. It's only the asymmetry really appears in the later parts of the strain. And as, that's what you can see here, that once this trunk really tests its limits, um, you can see that they're really two different, two different items. Um, here's a little bit more into how the, um, the trunk varies from the tip to the base. One of the big questions is how it can sense its surroundings when it's doing all these tasks. And one of the answers appears to be is that um, hairs might be the way it senses its surroundings. Because as I mentioned, the trunk, the thickness is quite, the thickness of the skin really prohibits senses from going through. Here's a hair that was originally embedded in one of the folds. And uh, as the trunk opens up, it basically opens up more potential sensors to sense its environment. Um, the length of the hairs appears to be consistent with other animals. Um, so that's actually the um, tip of the trunk. What says that the tip of the trunk kind of doesn't see that the rest of the elephant is so massive. Um, the length of the whiskers on the tip is kind of like the length of the whiskers of a cat. Um, uh, that's just, this is all animals' whisker lengths. And it tells you that it's really um, just sensing its local surroundings. Um, but the hairs on the base, those are really meant, you know, those are almost 10 centimeters long, as long as my forearm. Those are really meant to sense uh, objects that are really, really far away. The last part I, I want to talk about elements is about the skin before I talk about some ignoble prize stuff. Um, uh, it's still a mystery what sets the thickness at different parts of the trunk. I think they're, they're interacting with different parts of the world with different forces. Um, but in general, they're about 1 25th the thickness of the diameter, um, with it going all the way up to about um, uh, 50 sheets of paper, you know, about, uh, point, uh, about 0.5 centimeters, um, all the way down, all the way down to uh, about 0.2 centimeters. I'm starting to see some pretty interesting trends in the um, collagen and the different skin layers. So. To get strength, elephants have something that's very similar to the bottom of your foot. Um, like all the skin on your body, you've got four layers. Um, a tough stratum corneum on the outer layer. Um, uh, that's, so on the middle images here, this is actually the bottom of a human foot. Um, so it's all skin, but the bottom of your foot has a very thick stratum corneum, after which we do the viable epidermis and the epidermis and the dermis, which is um, really sensitive. The rest of your body is coated with a very thin stratum corneum. So it's really just thickening that outer layer. Um, and so it turns out the elephant trunk has got a combination of parts that you would expect on the bottom of your foot and the rest of your body. Um, for example, uh, we measure the stratum corneum at different uh, positions of the trunk, the dorsal and ventral side, um, and positions proximal and distal. And we measured the collagen fiber orientation. Um, so Collagen fibers are what give uh, uh, basically the skin its stiffness and also its flexibility. Um, essentially, depending on the orientation of the fibers, you can get one or the other. Uh, this is just a, basically a series of images showing you the collagen fibers are pointing in basically balanced directions uh, towards the vertical and towards the horizontal. And that's actually very different from the human body. So, the human body chooses generally, you have two types of skin in your body. You've got basically really um, tough skin, which is the bottom of your foot, for example, plantar skin. And that's when the collagen fibers should be oriented um, medial, medial lateral. So that's basically, you know, from the bottom of your foot outwards. If you want skin that's really flexible, like the stuff on my face and everywhere else, you want your collagen fibers oriented perpendicular to that. So basically along the skin so you can stretch it. And it turns out the trunk is the only part of the mantle that we can find that actually has balanced orientations. It's got basically a combination of strength and flexibility by having orientations in both directions, as you saw from the images. Um, and it also has uh, basically 
a thick part of the stratum corneum where it really needs to be thick to protect itself is really at the tip and at the base. I guess it uses the top of its forehead to run into objects. It uses the tip of its trunk to touch thorns and other parts. And everywhere in the middle, it's sort of thinner. But overall, it has a molecular structure that represents the balanced strength and flexibility. OK, um, I've got 20 minutes left to tell you about um, some work that I was never funded for. Um, and that's for my work with the Ig Nobel Prize. Um, uh, winning the Ig Nobel Prize twice is probably the biggest highlight of my career. It's the only award ceremony my wife said, I'll actually come to this ceremony to get the thousands of paper airplanes thrown at you. Uh, this is me uh, back in um, uh, 2013 with a toilet seat in my head for winning my prize on urination. Uh, that's the eight-year-old girl that yells at you to stop your speech after one minute. Um, this is me uh, just two years ago, uh, before COVID, wearing my wombat poop uh, costume with my fantastic co-author, who's now a professor at Tsinghua University in Taiwan, Richard Yang. Um, so like I said, this was the, pretty much the crowning achievement of my career um, at Harvard University, accepting these awards. Um, and this is pretty much my low point. Um, uh, I don't, I'll turn this sound off, but um, a little bit after the Ig Nobel Prize and um, being uh, did this published internationally, um, I got a call from my university office to turn on the show Fox and Friends, um, where uh, they basically put a bunch of scientists' work on this game show wheel, and they asked us to, they asked um, uh, people to spin the wheel, and you basically would stop on one of these random studies. And then here's Senator Jeff Flake, retired recently. Um, talking about how this study is such a waste of money. Well, my university was so upset at me uh, about this, the game, the, the show, because um, uh, unlike the other scientists who were only featured once, I was actually featured three times in one year. So that means I was responsible for 15% of the entire nation, wasteful science. Um, thank you, thank you. It's, it's a big accomplishment. I, I, I've really got to do better than three next time. And I'll tell you about a few of them. So, um, and if you have time, I actually encourage you to check out uh, Jeff Flake's waste book. It's, all these studies are fascinating. For example, we got this study, um, who's more attractive cheerleaders? Oh, why are cheerleaders more attractive in a squad? It's a fascinating study about psychology and the, um, the human eye that it basically takes the averages of the faces. So when you see several faces together, it sees the average length and width of those faces and makes them more, um, Average and it seems uh, that's more attractive to us. So the eye plays tricks on this. Uh, every one of these studies has something fascinating in it. So I'll tell you about um, some of them. Um, so this this is again um, uh, I borrowed another piece of Young He Chang's equipment. Um, this is my grad student's dog. He's a professor at University of Tennessee now, Andrew Dickerson. Um, his Labrador Retriever. And actually, this is one of my favorite videos because this is I was doing science on a budget. Uh, I still am. That's just a pink straw uh, taped to the back of the dog. Um, so these dogs, they shake. We weigh the dog before and after. It shakes about a pound of water in about four shakes. Uh, the one of the reasons that's possible is that it has very large skin deflections. So that skin, ordinarily, it goes back and forth one, uh, from 1 o'clock to 11 o'clock. Here it goes back and forth nine, 3 o'clock to 9 o'clock. You can't do that with the back of your skin. And I'm getting older, my skin's getting looser, but I still can't do it exactly. It's one of the answers why animals have such loose skin to basically facilitate the shake. One of the things we discovered that all mammals with hair have to have the shake to remove water. Um, and in fact, they're all kind of tuned around about 30 times Earth's gravity. Um, so smaller animals, because they have a smaller radius, they've got to have a larger shake frequency. This is that dog you just saw was about about uh, eight times a second, whereas this rat um, is about 15 times a second, and a mouse is 30 times a second. Um, here it's actually got to shut its eyes to prevent um, its eyeballs from popping out. Um, the soft organs are really the most damaged when you're going at 15, 30 G. A typical car crash is only 5 or 10 G. Here's another one piece of Young He's Chang's equipment, um, an x-ray of these animals shaking. Um, This is a rat. And you can see, as I said, the backbone is really prohibitive. Um, if it didn't have this loose skin, the water, a lot of that water would really stay on. 
if it basically can triple the amplitude, it can increase the force by a factor of uh, nine, and that allows nine times um, the force and allows much more water to be removed. Thanks, Young He. Okay, so that was uh, lesson number one in Jeff Flake's uh, basically say don't uh, don't do this work. Um, lesson number two. Um, so these are my collaborators. Uh, one of them's uh, he's going to be. Uh, he actually went on to medical school based on this work. Um, uh, he's wearing the box of shorts. Um, uh, the other two are photographers. Um, I was changing diapers. I got peed on, and I got fascinated by this question of mechanics of urination and body size. Here's a video um, of the evolution of urination throughout the animal kingdom. So for a lot of animals that I found is that the smaller you are, the harder it is. Um, for example, these rats, they can't even generate a urine stream. The best they can generate is small urine gumballs. The pressure generated by the bladder can't actually overcome surface tension. As you get smaller and smaller, um, that surface tension really starts to be prohibitive. So the females actually have to lick, the mothers have to lick the urethras to clean their, clean their young. We're on Zoom, so maybe you did this right before the talk, or maybe you're in the bathroom right now, but this is what a goat's urine stream looks like. Um, if you've ever milked a cow, you probably don't want to hit, be hit with this. This is a bucket of urine um, coming out uh, of a thin sheet, so it makes this nice fluid fishbone structure. And this is my favorite video of all time. It's part one and part two of my student's PhD thesis all in the same video. I was so happy when she did this video. I said, this is really high efficiency research. Um, I got to play that elephant one one more time. Um, so the elephants, um, they actually, so the elephants actually urinate about 20 liters. So that's entire kitchen garbage can. That was a solid piece of poop and that just hit the ground and now it's liquid. Um, yeah, I gotta play it one, one last time here in case you missed it. So it was actually really difficult to get this video. We had to really wait until the elephants got up in the morning to get that 20 liters of urine. And so the big question is, is how do you get 20 liters out? Um, and what we discovered was that all these animals have very different flow rates because all of them are urinating in around the same amount of time. Except any animal above three kilograms urinates at about 21 seconds. The elephant comes this trick. That video was actually a female elephant, which has a PB pipe, a urethra of around um, one of around uh, 1.5 meters. Um, that's for female elephant. And what that urethra did, we discovered, is it provides an extra height to the bladder to allow the extra gravitational forces to pull it out faster. For example, if you take a Gatorade jug, you want to basically poke a hole near the bottom to get the strongest jet. And that's what these animals are doing. Uh, but it doesn't want to carry around a big bladder. It just wants to carry around a really big pee, pee pipe. For example, you can show this at home. We've got a rhino jug, a human dog, and a dog jug with the appropriate pee, pee pipe dimensions. You can get them all emptying around in the same time just by having the pee, pee pipe of the right length and diameter. So go ahead, test it at home. I bet your urination time, 66% uh, of people have it between 10 and 30 seconds. If you're on this call, you're between 60 and 80 years old, um, your PP time might be longer. Um, a Japanese urologist was so fascinated by this work that he published a handbook of the PB times that signify healthy urethras, uh, but you can get up a little higher because of your prostate and uh, other kinds of bladder issues. Okay, in the last uh, 10 minutes here, uh, I wanna tell you about my most recent Ig Nobel Prize. Um, uh, this is, this is actually 3D scan from the Invention Studio at Georgia Tech of a wombat, cube of wombat feces that was sent to me for $2,000 from Australia uh, by our collaborator, Scott Carver. They are quite cubic. You can play games of chance with them. Um, they really do have six sides. So, all right. Um, so this is Scott Carver. Um, uh, he studies mange in wombats. Um, as you can see, wombats are about the size of a small toddler, but actually run faster than an adult man, as Scott found out. Oh, yeah, they're so hard to catch. Um, they're, yeah, they're around um, a third our size, um, but they have very strong muscular legs because they have built about 20 to 50 meters of underground burrows, which they'll hide in. They are the world's second most cutest animal. First, of course, being the pandas. 
But without the pandas, they would definitely be number one. Look at this teddy bear face. Uh, they live most of the daytime underground in their underground burrows. They they live in very in Tasmania. It's very hot and dry there. Um, they're drought tolerant. Um, they eat completely grasses. Those are two joeys that you just saw. And if there are any parents who have their kids on the call, because school hasn't started yet for some people, um, you kids, if you think you have it bad, imagine if you're a, a baby wombat. They actually get pooped on on a regular basis because their, female, their mother's pouches actually point back. They actually point so they don't get filled with mud as they're digging their holes. So they actually get pooped on about 100 times a day. Where does that poop go? Now, this gets to the mystery. Um, and that's what I love about biology, that there's so many different, there's about 6,000 different mammals. But only one has cubic feces. In fact, even the other wombat relatives, the, uh, the bare-nosed wombat, which we studied, the hairy-nosed wombats, do not have as cubic as ones that, of the bare nose. It's still not really known, but we have hypothesis of why that is. So um, what you see here are stumps and logs, and these are what the wombats call latrines. Basically, the wombats live in a home range, a place where it roams uh, to look for mates and tasty grasses. And it rims the edge of this range with these latrines. And we think what happens is that these, these wombat poops, it leaves 100 of these poops all in one place, that they act as chemical and visual markers. If you want to basically make a marker, you want to make a cairn. Yes, a cairn of poop so you can warn your predators and your greatest enemies. But what happened to Wombat Ground Zero? Wombat Ground Zero laid a cylindrical poop and it rolled down the log. So all that work of climbing on the top of the log was just wasted. Well, evolution happened. And I think what happened is that the wombat said, hey, let's just came up with square poop so they won't roll. Now, that's where our research comes in. How do they make them square? Now, in Australian folklore, the theory is that they have square buttholes and that it's kind of like making spaghetti that if you have basically a die of a certain shape, your sort of pasty material will push through the die and uh, will allow you to um, make it the shape that you want. But here's that's the cute wombat, pudgy little legs and that anus, and you see there's no square shapes to be found. In fact, nature is a lot more creative than just making a die. This next image is kind of graphic. This is a poor wombat that was hit by a car that Scott Carver was managed to salvage. And those are the intestines that, as I said, were shipped to us for about 2,000 bucks uh, from Australia. The intestines of a wombat are incredibly long. They're, um, our intestines are about 10 meters long or 30 feet. Um, the wombat's intestines are exactly the same length. But the amazing thing is they're only a third our body size. So it means its body is really almost filled with intestines. It does have such a long intestines because it's trying to extract as much water as possible. The poop that you get out of your toilet is about 80% water. Wombats are about 60%. But that's not even pushing the envelope of what's possible. Rats and mice have around even 60%. Near its stomach, this is what you would expect a wombat's poop to look like, kind of like a grass mixed with chyme, which is digestive juices. But a little bit later, um, you see poop that has darkened due to its loss of water and grown edges and square sides. It's really, really square inside its body. So the, how does it get this constant uniform length of the poop? I'll address that first. And this is a paper that Ben McGondu, he's an undergraduate that's uh, looking for a PhD advisor at Georgia Tech. We're trying to publish this the way it gets the constant length is by having a very slow drying rate. And if you look around the world, this is, uh, this is also generating geometric shapes like hexagons. Um, those of you lucky enough to go to Giants Causeway Island is a beach full of uh, volcanic rock that, that basically took 100 years to cool. When rock cools, it shrinks. And if it cools slowly enough, the cracks that form due to the shrinkage will be uniform so that you get hexagons. That same feat can be repeated with drying cornstarch and water, which is what Ben did. And if you have a trough of cornstarch, you get constant length cracks. And we think the wombat with its five to three day digestive time, which is uh, ours is only one to two days, um, allows the poops to form slowly enough that you get regular cracks. 
And that's also how um, horses and other animals also get pretty regular life size poop, um, those with pellet shaped feces. Now, how did it get the square cross section? Um, and uh, so in my lab, we, uh, we got these intestines. And the first thing I did, so that's my lab in Cherry Emerson, the biology building. Um, the first thing I did is I said, hey, take these intestines and let's hang it from the ceiling uh, like a gruesome Christmas ornament. And um, let's have them rotate around until they basically just get equilibrium. And this is what I was thinking. Imagine if I had a sock full of dice and if I just had those dice jumble around for a couple of days, I would think you'd just lose those corners and edges. But what I suspected would turn out to be the case is that wombats, all of those cubes were aligned, which told me that there's a coordinate system inside those intestines that tell you where those corners are going to be. This is NHK, one of my favorite channels, uh, them showing you how basically the intestines have these red regions, which we just measured with material measurements that are basically four times as stiff as the soft regions. Um, over 50,000 contractions that occur over the three to five days, those will sculpt the cube. So we basically performed, uh, let me just, let's just that part. We performed these numerical simulations of basically a viscous material, one of the last band performing cons repeated contractions. And imagine you've got calamari and you've got two parts of the calamari used overcooked here. That's these two red regions. If you're four times stiffer, it means you're going to contract with four times the amount of strength. And so that's why if you've got it really, as calamari cooks, it shrinks. And that's why you get two of the corners of your poop. The stiff calamari has contracted more strongly, and that generates two corners. Now, imagine the rest of your calamari is kind of loose and floppy. Those are far away from your stiff regions. And so those are essentially left behind as your stiff regions are contracting. That being left behind, uh, basically results in two other corners, um, as you see here. Um, incidentally, if wombats had three bands of stiffness, they would actually get hexagonal feces. Um, but uh, I haven't seen that in nature yet. And these are 100 random wombat feces picked up by um, uh, Scott Carver on uh, Maria Island. We, we created a, a squareness matrix. And unfortunately, our model requires wombat feces to be a lot less viscous than it is. Our feces, our computer simulations, only get feces of kind of this shape. Real wombats, are they've got 10 times the inertia. We don't know where the discrepancy lies, but it might lie to the three-dimensionality involved. But that's for future researchers. So you've been a great audience. It's been such a pleasure to talk about um, gross biomechanics to the American Society of Biomechanics. Um, a couple months ago, I was at the Harvard Colloquium, the IEEE, Cal Academy of Sciences, the Secret Science uh, Seminar in Brooklyn. McCary, just this week with you guys, I'll be at Washington State University Pullman, APSD bio to give a 10 minute life history talk in person at Virginia Tech at Society of Integrated Comparative Biology for Bio and Fair Design and Genentech. The book's on Amazon, Audible. Um, it's been read by eight hours by an Italian-American actor and translated into three languages. So with that, I'm happy to open the floor to answer any questions. You can email me or Twitter me if I don't get you in the next 10 minutes. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, so my student, Stephen Allen, is going to take questions in the chat. So if you've got some questions for Dr. Who, please um, post those in the chat. I've seen quite a bit of chatter in the chat. But yeah, if you've got some questions, great. Um, yeah, definitely. We'll, we'll take a moment as people are typing out their questions. Um, Dr. Who, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'll, I'll start off with a question of my own. Um, with the experience of kind of being featured in Wastebook uh, and kind of the reports, did that kind of change like your approach to disseminating your work? Or are there any kind of new bits of information that you give to up and coming students or postdocs on, on how to uh, um, display work that seems initially odd. Yeah, the um, so there's a whole physics um, physics today uh, APS and news about uh, basically that whole aspect that basically if you're doing animal research and you're doing something interesting, um, you do have a high chance of sort of getting sort of attacked by these things. I mean, to be honest, 
I wouldn't have done anything differently. Like I, for example, this, there's pictures of these, um, like anything that makes for good science outreach, for example, like these beautiful pictures of my students' butts. You guys, I'm still sharing the screen, I think, right? Yeah. This was able to get it out there. I mean, but it's also let me, let me be attacked. So it's basically kind of like a two-edged sword. If you basically make it something that people want to actually hear, it's going to have a chance of being attacked. Um, and uh, they, I mean, the Wastebook folks, they've attacked shrimp on a treadmill. They've attacked all sorts of stuff. Um, I'll just say, keep on getting the work out there. And um, the, you know, the amazing thing about being on the Wastebook is actually one of the best things that happened to me because I had so many people come to my aid. I had so many nice emails. I mean, of course I get a hate mail once and, once and now again, but the Wastebook just brought so many people to my aid and said that there's so many people that really do, you know, want to see this kind of science. And, uh, and so it was one of the best things that happened. So um, if anyone has an ex experience with that, definitely let me know and I'll, I'll happy to sort of uh, give you a chat. I mean, it was pretty depressing the first day, but after that, I think um, all the things that happened after were great. Um, it looks like uh, Allison Sheet Singer is asked, it says, thank you very much for such a wonderful talk. Um, and uh, the questions have exposed such kind of beautiful biological mechanisms. How did you choose uh, your questions to pursue? Um, well, I think all PIs, they have basically the, you have a deck of research that continues from the past, um, but I'm always looking for new ideas. One of the big advice, pieces of advice I do have is you should, is everyone should try to talk to people that are sort of not active researchers. Um, for example, a lot of these ideas, for example, this whole funding of the elephant trunk was only po possible because I was at the Land Zoo uh, filming elephant urination and uh, you know the zookeepers were like, hey, you keep on looking at the elephant's butt, but hey, you know, there's other parts of the elephant too that are interesting. And I was like, like what? They're like, hey, have you ever looked at this trunk? It can do all these things. And they sort of took me to these demonstrations and they really have a really good feel of like what's really interesting. So they suggest they gave me this, they really funded, made this elephant research possible. But um, I also get a lot of email. Um, uh, being on Twitter and, um, you know, the nice thing about working with the press is that um, I get emails all the time from people all over the world about, you know, just stranger aspects of this research. For example, this wombat poop study all began as a dare because we had done this uh, urination study and this feces study of cylindrical feces. And then Ranger Rick magazine, um, there's a scientist whose son was reading Ranger Rick and he said, hey, we saw this article about cubic feces. Can your, can your model account for cubic feces? I said, of course not. I'm, I don't think we can. Uh, so we did the entire study as a dare, but we're really happy to do it. So keep on talking to non-scientists. They've got your their finger on some really interesting problems. That's great advice. Um, looks like Young He Chang uh, says it looks like there's uh, just more surface area on the dorsal side of the trunk versus the ventral. Is this taken into account in your measure of strain difference during the elongation? The, um, I agree in the folds. So when we do, uh, so the elongation, uh, that's just simply measuring two positions. Um, uh, uh, so no, we don't take that into account. It'd be kind of interesting to, uh, for example, I think a lot of the strain they get is through basically skin that's been sort of hidden and saved. Um, the strain of the actual skin um, is, is gonna be very low. The, the skin is actually very, very tough. So. So I think it's really due to um, the unleashing of these kinds of folds. Um, but I also agree, there's sort of skin on the sides too. So um, maybe uh, that'd, be, that'd be interesting. I, maybe I'd try to follow up with you after. When I return your mucus covered force balance. We'll wait for a couple more questions to come in. Um, you had also mentioned that elephants are capable of generating high stiffness uh, in their trunks, kind of much stiffer than human muscle. Um, do we know how this is achieved or do you have any ideas? So the caterpillar I mentioned also gets six megapascals. Um, the elephant we're observing is getting an effective one megapascal. Um, I think it's through the fact that the, the trunk also has a lot of blood in it. And uh, it, uh, the caterpillars, I think they're able to sort of prevent, they have these um, regions they can sort of block the blood from leaving. By having high pressure zones, you might be able to sort of have an effective material that has a way more higher stiffness. Um, but I'm guessing it's through basically the inclusion of liquids. Um, 
And that's not really an issue for a human skeletal muscle. I mean, we have blood veins, but it's not sort of as inflatable as the trunk is. The trunk is really, the really trunk has huge openings for vessels and things like that. And maybe, maybe it's the case that can actually prevent blood from leaving and that gets the stiffness. But that's a, it's a really good question. Um, uh, and uh, it's something that we're gonna have to have some really, right now our methods, we're probably gonna try to use um, the ultrasound to sort of see if we can send the blood flow or kind of um, any other kinds of motions uh, when it try to stiffen and prevent itself from bending. Uh, we've got um, Karen Troy asking, how do we as a community do better to advocate for and communicate the value of science for the sake of discovery and joy uh, without any particular application in mind? The, um, so there's this been study, a study. So if you look at science communication over the last 30 years, I think 20 years ago, people wanted to hear all about the applications um, that they thought scientists are really there to come with the next cure for cancer, come up with um, you know better materials for like um, you know safety. Um, but things have changed in the last ten years. Um, now people are satisfied with this you know, one line talk about the applications, any possible applications. The rest of it, they really want to hear about the story. They want to hear about the investigators. They want to see like people's butts, like I shown in this uh, urination footage. You know, and I, my grad students, I tell them, you know, when you're doing a study, keep all the funny stories that have happened over the years while you're doing it and keep any kind of weird photos of you doing the work that are unexpected. And I think, you know, a lot of people don't believe science is real and that's a real issue. Um, I think the more that we can show that this is actually done by real human beings that involved a huge amount of work to get these things done, um, a lot of creative work to do these things, the more we can get people to really believe in the process of doing science and science is not just a pile of facts, um, but it's this huge creative endeavor that requires this, this long journey. The more we can get that aspect of that out, the more people can see real scientists doing real work. Um, I think the, the, more, the more support we'll have and we'll need it. I mean, the next 10 or 20 years, we're definitely gonna have more issues with climate change and pandemics and we need people to trust, to trust scientists. Uh, I'll finish up with one more question from Sabrina Lee. Um, and she says, thanks for the great talk. And I remember I first saw you talk about hibernating bears and their super fast muscle contractions, which inspired me to incorporate comparative biomechanics into my research. How do we as a field support this interdisciplinary work at the undergraduate, graduate, and senior levels of research and education? So um, the nice thing about biomechanics is that I think it's it's really easy to get um, people involved. Um, I mean, we've got experimental and theoretical portions of people are interested in their bodies, they've got natural intuition. Um, I really support having undergraduates graduates in lab. Um, for example, the, uh, the two of these boxer short people are undergraduates. Um, uh, they're uh, we have in our lab, we have we, we have basically five grad students and about 25 undergrads. Um, that, that really get involved. Um, so I think getting people involved from all levels is important and having a culture of that. Um, having this interdisciplinary approach, I think is useful. I mean, I have a, my undergrad degrees in mechanical engineering. I actually don't have any degrees in biology, but I'm a professor of biology too at Georgia Tech. Um, I think getting lots of different approaches and that's gonna be even more important in the future. So the more we can break down silos and invite um, people from different disciplines and to these, to these conferences, I think, I think the better. Great answer. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yu. Uh, I'm just going to remind everybody, it's uh, in the chat as well, there's follow-up conversation within spatial chat, uh, room S3, Aristotle. So uh, please meet us there for further uh, discussion. Um, for now, if you guys, if everyone can join me in thanking Dr. Hu for his presentation, uh, and we will see you uh, down the conference later. Great. I'll see everyone in spatial chat. Thanks a lot. Thanks Thank for all you. these questions. Thank you. Elena, thanks for telling me the sound wasn't working. Yeah, no problem. It just cut out a little bit with the video, so. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Nice talk, thank you so much. Yeah, I'm glad we got some, <clears throat> yeah, I was able to get some people in the room. I think they're like 160 or something at some point.
Uh, no, it was over 200. I was, uh, I've been keeping track. So um, yeah, it was great. Accomplish the task of pulling people out of uh, the internet and into the conference. Yeah, I think Zoom fatigue is a real thing. So yeah, it's, uh, it's tricky, but um, yeah, that was fantastic. And so now to kind of extend the Zoom fatigue, <laughs> Or whatever, um, we'll jump over to spatial chat and. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's see if I can do that. I'm gonna try to join right now. Okay, sounds good. You probably have to jump off Zoom in order to get there, but okay. we'll All see right. you over there. All right. So Thank I'm gonna. You. Okay, let me see if I can copy and paste. Save chat too. Ian. I think we were able to answer most of uh, most of the questions actually um in in time and everything um do you still want me to send you the transcript uh i think i i got it just now okay. so yeah i got it so you're oh, all set. sweet okay, okay that, work, that works as well okay.